Okay, so this is our last segment for Privileged Planet. Um, if you recall the first Sunday I was talking, I talked really about old earth versus young earth creationism uh, and how if you really take the Bible seriously, you cannot be an old earther. Uh, and then this uh, last Sunday we talked about these things. Uh, all the, um, I think there were like a dozen or so conditions that must exist for a planet to, to be able to sustain complex life. If you don't have any of those dozen or so conditions, you're not going to have it. So it's like 12 boxes to fill, okay? Now the truth of the matter is we're, the video we're watching um, gave you the 12 or so conditions because those are the sexy ones. Those, those are the cool ones. There's actually 147 conditions that need to be um, met in order for a planet to meet uh, conditions for sustainable life. 147, all right? And we can just keep going down the list. All these conditions need to be met. And if you can see the tiny print, all of them have a certain probability chance of like a 110, that's 0.1, or one in 100 chance in, in the, that this planet would exist, and so on, okay? So there are all these lists of probabilities that need to be met. So the ultimate question then is, what is, whoops, what is, how many, how many conditions do scientists know today, in 2020, that have to exist in order to have a planet or a moon or some kind of a body to be able to sustain complex life? It needs to be 147, all right? So think of all those circles, I put 147 circles down there. Think of all those circles like a condition or a box to check. If you don't check 147 boxes at this point, according, at, at this point in our knowledge about complex life, you're not going to have complex life. So for instance, there's a one in 10 chance that the size of the galaxy is correct. You can have galaxies that are too big, galaxies that are too small. In order to sustain a planet that can sustain complex life. So if you see that it's one in 10, that means we can rule out, in all the universe, 90% of the galaxies are gonna be able to uh, have a planet that sustains complex life. Does that make sense? So, and that's one box to check. Another one could be the number of moons that a planet has. It's crazy enough, and we're gonna talk about the moon later. The moon is important for the sustaining of complex life on Earth. Okay, because the moon keeps our axis at 23 degrees. The moon um, plays with the oceans, right, and recycles oxygen in the water and so on. Okay, so <clears throat> there's a two inch, I mean, 80% of the planets that have moons won't have a moon that qualifies for, for um, helping the planet to, complex, to sustain complex life. Another one would be oxygen to nitrogen ratio in the atmosphere. Another one would be the brightness of a star. The star needs to be not too bright, it's kind of like Goldilocks. Not too hot, not too cold, it needs to be just right. And you see the chances of there, one in 10,000. That means trillions and trillions of stars just won't do it, okay? And then the also, must, for instance, I found this, uh, a percentage of ozone in the troposphere. Ozone helps keep out uh, gamma rays and the, the deadly rays from, from the sun. Uh, one in 100, and by the way, the troposphere is where airplanes fly. I had to look that up. You know, which, which layer is the troposphere? I don't know. It's the one that airplanes uh, travel back and forth in. It's the lowest layer, okay? So, figure this out now. In terms of, complex, in terms of what are the odds? So if we multiply all those boxes, some of, one box is like a one in 100, one box is a one in a 10, but we have 147 boxes we need to bulk multiply. I know it's early in the morning. I hope you're following me. Okay, what happens when we multiply all those probability boxes together? What probability do we end up with? We end up with this. One in 10 to the 282nd power, okay? And maybe some of you remember, I told you how many atoms are in the, microwave, or in the Milky Way galaxy last week. Remember that? How many atoms, not how many bodies of, of, of um, astrological bodies or astronomical bodies, how many atoms? There are one to 10 to the 64 atoms. That's one with 64 zeros behind it, okay? Now, what are the odds of the universe producing complex life? One with 282 zeros behind it. Isn't that amazing? It's like more, the odds are greater than there are atoms in the galaxy. So, 
just in terms of putting it in a, in a word phrase, that is one in a million trillion 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 almost done trillion 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 that's 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 the word that that's the probability for a universe randomly producing complex life okay and so now we're at the point where both creationists and naturalists say our universe can't do it. Our universe could not do it. Not enough time. Even at 13.8 billion years, it can't do it. So now you know what's being bandied around in the scientific community? This is being bandied around. The multiverse. Okay? Lots of people, you have high up cultural figures like Neil deGrasse Tyson. You ever hear, hear of that guy? Uh, or uh, Bill Nye, the science guy. These are like the cultural science guys. They bring up the multiverse as a way of solving the problem of chance just producing complex life. So what is the multiverse? The multiverse is simply, do you see how we, there are a bunch of bubbles? Our universe is one big bubble, okay? It's an expanding bubble, but it's just one bubble unto itself. But there are other bubbles that exist outside of our bubble. Many, many, many universes. And here's the interesting part. Think of the universe like, like or think of the multiverse like foam, okay? And our, our universe is somewhere amongst the foam. But there are lots and lots of other bubbles in the foam of the multiverse. And guess how many universes need to exist in the worldview of naturalist scientists like Neil deGrasse Tyson or Bill Nye? How many universes? Is it 10 to the 282 universes, right? Can't even be that. According to them, in order to make sure that we have one universe that will accommodate complex life like us, you need to have an infinity of universes. An infinity. Because even if, even if there are 10 to the 282nd power number of universes, that still leaves a chance that none of them can do the job, correct? We need to have a, un we need to have a reality in their minds where there are an infinity number of universes so that for sure, we end up with our universe. Does that make sense? Okay, so it's like here's our dilemma. We have on the one hand, we have creationists need one universe and one transcendent being that created the universe. We need just one, okay? Because that transcendent being thinks up the design of what the universe is gonna be and then calls it into existence through the power of his word. We just need one though. Naturalists on the other hand, like Bill Nye and those guys, they need an infinity of universes. So it's either one God and one universe, or no God and an infinity of universes. Now doesn't an infinity of anything sound kind of quasi-religious? Sounds kind of like a religious view, doesn't it? And it very much is. It very much is. If, because when you can't have science explain fully anything, then you're moving into the metaphysical and the religious. And can science our scientific method, can it explain an infinity? Now, it can only mark it down like that. That'll, that probably goes on forever, but we'll never know. Science can't get to the other side of infinity, correct? So whenever, whenever naturalists bring up an infinity of multiverses, they're not bringing up a scientific point of view. They're bringing up um, a metaphysical or a religious point of view. They're laying their, their religious presupposition on top of their scientific explanations. Do you follow me? Okay. So, um, what is, what's next? All right, so for complex life, again, to exist, it's against such great odds. Uh, but nevertheless, our universe has a planet that has complex life on it. It has marine iguanas. It has tobacco plants. It has, uh, next, it has dolphins, and it has hummingbirds. And by the way, tobacco plants are actually quite complex. I don't know if you guys know that. How many chromosomes do humans have? How many pairs? 23, right. And so you would think, being the apple of God's eye, which the Bible says we are, we would think, okay, we are the greatest and most majestic created thing in the universe or on earth because we have the most chromosomes. Thank you, O oh Lord, for your great power and majesty. But the, 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 the truth of it is, we, don't have, we can't stand up on having the most chromosomes because we have 23 pairs. Guess who has one more pair of chromosome? Tobacco plant. 
The tobacco plant has 24 pairs of chromosomes. So it, <laughs> I just find that very interesting, that we don't even have the most chromosomes, but yet we are uh, the image of God himself, and we are the most complex thing ever in that existed in the universe. Because not only are we complex in our makeup, but there's one more aspect to it. We are complex because we are things that like to explore the earth and the universe and the solar system. We have a curiosity in us. Tobacco doesn't have a curiosity. It has more chromosomes, but it's not curious about anything. We have this curiosity built into us. So, not, so Neil deGrasse Tyson and Bill Nye, they have to look at the fact that, yes, complex life is impossible to um, arrive on its own without design or guidance. So we need an infinity of universes. But not only is it complex like an iguana is complex, we are complex in the sense that we're intelligent. We're curious. We're curious things, okay? And it pleases God for us to investigate his universe. As a matter of fact, the universe, it's turning out more and more, it's kind of like an escape room. Have you guys ever been in an escape room? The whole point of, of an escape room, it's a very specifically designed thing. And there are knobs and, and switches and dials and things to pull in and out for the inhabitants of the room to investigate in order to get to the end goal of getting the door open of the escape room, okay? It, now it looks like the universe <clears throat> is more and more designed kind of like an escape room. It's meant to be looked at and unpacked and, and, and investigated by the inhabitants, by the only things that have intelligence, us, okay? So not only are we complex, we're complex and we're smart. We can, we can check things out, which is cool, which is very, very cool. Okay, and because, you know, you know why we're smart? We're endowed with God's image. He's smart, okay? Of course, the curse of sin has made us look through a glass darkly, as it says through the Bible. We, our smartness is only so extended. Uh, but we're, nevertheless, we're smart. We can figure things out. Okay, so um, now we're going to head into the next, as the final aspect of this series, which is to unpack how is it that the universe and earth look like it's, it's designed to be investigated. That God made the earth, and God made humans, and God gave humans sort of the mandate, now check it out, learn about it, because I gave you the brains to do it, okay? The first thing we're gonna look at now is the moon. The moon is very cool. When you consider chance as an explanation for a planet like earth, Up you have to look at it in the context of the universe as a whole. While the odds appear astonishingly small that you'd get all the right ingredients to support complex life at this one place in the galaxy, you have to keep in mind that our galaxy is just one of perhaps 100 billion galaxies in the observable universe. Still, logically, I think you have to ask yourself, what if this convergence of factors didn't come about as the result of simply a cosmic lottery or a mere fluke or luck, but what if it's the result of some larger underlying purpose or design? And if the Earth does exist for a purpose, is there any way that we could tell? On October the 24th, 1995, a rare natural phenomenon unexpectedly triggered a unique search for an answer. Oh, look at this guy. It started with an experience I had in 1995. I went to observe a total eclipse of the sun in India. It was my first and still only total eclipse of the sun. It was a spectacular event. It's just an experience for all the emotions. Either astronomers who can understand the whole phenomenon and can predict it to within a second of time anywhere on the Earth, or a local native are equally in awe and reacting in the same way to this incredible phenomenon. It really left a big impression on me. For 51 unforgettable seconds, Guillermo Gonzalez and thousands of others looked on in wonder at this rare astronomical event. Gonzalez would later reflect upon both the mysterious beauty he had witnessed in the North Indian skies and the factors that had made it possible. The requirements for producing a total eclipse of the sun are a luminous body, in our case the sun, an eclipsing body, 
in our case the moon, and then an observer platform, in our case the surface of the Earth, and they all have to be in a straight line in space. The apparent size of the moon and the sky has to be almost exactly the same as the apparent size of the sun and the sky. They're both about half a degree. The sun is 400 times bigger than the moon, but it's 400 times further away. So there's this coincidence people have noted for centuries, but they just said, oh, well, it's a coincidence, and shrug their shoulders. As Gonzalez examined this rare alignment of sun, moon, and earth, he recognized the importance of these celestial bodies to the existence of complex life on our planet. The gravitational pull exerted by our moon, for example, is strong enough to regulate the Earth's climate by stabilizing its tilt and helping to circulate the warm and cold waters of its oceans. While our planet's distance from the sun permits both liquid water and an oxygen-rich atmosphere. You have to have the right distance of the observer's home planet from its host star. And you have to have a large moon. And so there's this very strong overlap between the requirements for producing eclipses and the requirements for habitability, for having a planet that can support life. In 1999, Gonzalez described this relationship between our survival and our ability to observe solar eclipses in the journal Astronomy and Geophysics. His ideas intrigued philosopher Jay Richards. I've been focusing my research in cosmology and in particular on applying probability theory to the fine-tuning of the laws of physics. I had a strong sense that this evidence pointed towards some sort of wider purpose to the universe. And then I read Gonzalez's work and I had the same feeling that he did, that perfect solar eclipses were sort of the tip of the iceberg, the first instance of an entire class of evidence that provides a way uh, for judging if the universe is the result of a fluke or some impersonal process or the result of purpose or design. In the summer of 1999, Gonzalez and Richards initiated a program of joint research. They began their study by considering a characteristic of solar eclipses little known outside the scientific community. These striking events are not only compelling to observe, they also open a portal onto the physics and chemistry of the entire universe. Really, you can think of eclipses as a giant natural experiment. Uh, set up that allows us to observe a part of the sun that's critical towards understanding how its light is produced in its atmosphere. The fact that the Earth is going around the sun and the moon is around the Earth and the sizes and the distances between the Earth and the moon and the sun are just so to give you a perfect solar eclipse is a wondrous thing because it allows us to measure the constituents of the upper layers of the sun's atmosphere. During a solar eclipse, the moon fits so perfectly over the sun that it shields its blinding light, providing astronomers with a view of the star's atmosphere, otherwise impossible to experience. At the moment of totality, the pinkish arc of the chromosphere, the atmosphere's innermost layer, becomes visible. And with it, a rainbow-like band called the flash spectrum appears when the sun is viewed through a prism. The eclipse of 1870 led to an understanding of the structure of the sun's chromosphere and the discovery of helium, the second most abundant element in the universe. The spectrum is probably the single greatest source of information about a star. And it was during a couple of historic eclipses in the 19th century that astronomers figure out how the spectrum of the sun is produced. And they only were able to figure it out because of the particular circumstances during a total eclipse. These circumstances are both precise and crucial. If our moon was slightly larger, it would partially block our view of the chromosphere and diminish its spectral light. A smaller moon would allow too much light from the sun, destroying our view of the solar atmosphere and the flash spectrum. And so you have to have a nearly perfect match between the sun and the moon, so you don't hide the chromosphere. And that insight afforded by eclipses in the 19th century is what finally permitted astronomers to figure out how the spectra of distant stars are produced. Really, that opened up stellar astrophysics and allowed us to understand how other stars work, because distant stars, after all, are other suns. The relationship between eclipses and scientific discovery was also revealed in the spring of 1919. 
On May the 29th, research teams headed by British astronomer Arthur Eddington photographed the sun and adjacent stars in the Hyades star cluster during the darkness of totality. Later analysis of the pictures verified that the sun's gravity bent light from distant stars traveling toward the Earth at the angle Albert Einstein had predicted. Einstein's theory of relativity, an idea that revolutionized our understanding of the universe, had been confirmed during a total solar eclipse. And that experiment was only possible because the stars become visible during a total eclipse. They're very important in the history of science. And the best place in the entire solar system to view solar eclipses is from the surface of the Earth. I've actually calculated the circumstances for eclipses from all the other planets and all the other moons, about 65 of them, the, the major moons. And it's an amazing coincidence. The one place that has observers is the one place that has the best eclipses. Within the gossamer light of a solar eclipse, Gonzalez and Richards recognized a fascinating connection between the factors necessary for complex life and scientific observation. But was this merely an isolated fluke of nature or a glimpse at a principle and a purpose fundamental to the universe as a whole? That was the million dollar question that we continually had before us. What if those things that make a planet habitable also make that planet the best place for making scientific discoveries? That is, what if those rare locations in the universe uh, that are compatible with observers like ourselves are also the best places overall for making observations? For three years, Richards and Gonzalez meticulously tested their idea against evidence gathered from a wide range of scientific disciplines. In the 2004 book, The Privileged Planet, they published their hypothesis. The same narrow circumstances that allow us to exist also provide us with the best overall setting for making scientific discoveries. In the book, we detail more than a dozen examples of this correlation between life and discovery. And these aren't quirky, marginal examples. Each treats a condition critical to its respective scientific field. Some deal with remote things, like the nature of galaxies. Others are much closer to home. Okay, so what to pull off from that little section is, it's, it's, isn't it interesting, as curious people that we are, that the moon, the size of the moon is necessary for the tides, and it's necessary to keep the axis of the Earth tilted at 23 degrees so that we can have seasons, okay? But the size of the moon, it turns out, is necessary for curious human beings because during an eclipse, the, mo the moon, which is 400 times smaller than the sun, moves into the disk of the sun, which is 400 times farther away. Perfect match, revealing the atmosphere of the sun. And in the 1870s, that scientist did, had had the atmosphere of the moon refracted through his little prism back on Earth, and it divided it into that rainbow spectrum, and helium was discovered. <laughs> the second most abundant, of the abundant element of the universe was discovered because the moon exists. And the moon exists and it does things. It, does, it makes eclipses. And not only that, but during another eclipse later on at the turn of the century, a guy named Eddington discovered, hey, look it, we can see starlight much better during an eclipse. And it turns out that starlight is bent according to gravity, and the sun has a heck of a lot of gravity, and starlight is actually bent a little bit when it's going around the sun on its way to Earth. And that confirmed Einstein's theory of relativity, and with that, science just proceeded gangbusters after that. Theory of relativity is a huge component of modern science, okay? So isn't it interesting? The moon, which keeps us alive, also keeps our knowledge also helps keep feeding our knowledge at the same time. You know, body and mind. We, the, our body and our mind enjoy the fact that the moon is that big. Which, by the way, no other, no other planet in our solar system has a moon that big. Okay? It has, there, what did Gonzalez say, 65 moons in the solar system? Saturn has moons, Jupiter, Neptune, Uranus has moons. Uh, and they're all various sizes. But our moon is unusually big. Uh, 
And God made it so because it can do stuff when it's that size, when it's that perfect size. It can do stuff for Earth and it can do stuff for humans as well. So that's the moon, okay? Part of our escape room. We need the lever of the moon. Okay, next, the atmosphere. Our atmosphere is actually pretty cool. And here's a shorter explanation. While a perfect solar eclipse was the catalyst for Gonzalez and Richard's hypothesis, their observations would never have been possible without another, more familiar example of the correlation between life and discovery, the atmosphere of the Earth. It's striking when you see pictures of the Earth from the Apollo missions or other spacecraft and you see this very thin layer of the atmosphere surrounding the Earth that sustains all the life that we know on Earth. And so you need a certain mix of elements uh, to support a complex biosphere uh, like ours. Not just any atmosphere will do. Our appreciation of the Earth's atmosphere has increased significantly during the last 40 years as exploratory spacecraft have probed the solar system. These missions have confirmed that within the Sun's family of more than 70 planets and moons, the Earth is one of seven bodies enveloped by a thick canopy of gas. Yet among these seven, only the Earth's atmosphere can sustain complex life. And only the Earth's atmosphere is transparent. It's an atmosphere that's made up of mostly oxygen and nitrogen with very little carbon dioxide and very little other carbon compounds or atoms in the atmosphere that gives you a transparent atmosphere. If we had too much carbon in the atmosphere, we get hazes, organic hazes in the atmosphere, like you see on the, the large moon Titan, for example. The dense shroud of gas that blankets Saturn's largest moon resembles the atmospheres surrounding Neptune, Uranus, Saturn, Jupiter, and the greenhouse cauldron of Venus. None of these alien worlds know the stars, or even offers a clear view of the sun. Now, of course, if you were suddenly transported to Titan or Venus or to one of the outlying gas giant planets, the lack of a clear view of the universe wouldn't be much of an issue because you'd be dead. But that's precisely the point. If we're right, if the conditions for habitability and scientific discovery appear in the same places, then you're going to get conditions like you do on Earth, an atmosphere that sustains complex life like ourselves and also enables scientific discovery of the universe around us. The virtues of such an atmosphere are continually tested. As the Earth moves through space, it is bombarded by radiation from throughout the universe. This radiation is emitted by the Sun and other celestial objects, including supernovas and distant galaxies. It reaches our planet in wavelengths, described as gamma, X-ray, ultraviolet, visible, infrared, microwave, and radio. Together, they comprise the electromagnetic spectrum. Almost all of these wavelengths are invisible to the eye and either lethal or useless to organic life. Yet within this spectrum of frequencies, a thin sliver of radiation proves essential to plants, animals, and human beings. In other words, there's really just a very narrow part of the electromagnetic spectrum that's going to be useful for living processes like photosynthesis. It's not as if life could have evolved to use gamma radiation or X-ray radiation or something like that. There's really just a narrow part of the spectrum that would be useful to life processes. Well, as it turns out, that's also the same narrow part of the spectrum that is the most informative about the various structures that we discover in the universe around us. These specific frequencies that enable plants to manufacture food and astronomers to observe the cosmos represent less than one trillionth of a trillionth of the universe's range of natural electromagnetic emissions. Fortunately, it is the type of light our sun produces in abundance and that most easily penetrates the filtering shield of our atmosphere to reach the surface of the Earth. It's a remarkable coincidence that the kind of atmosphere that's needed for complex life like ourselves does not preclude that life from observing the distant universe. It's a surprise. It's something that you wouldn't expect just chance to produce. Why would the universe be such that those places that are most habitable 
also offer the best opportunity for scientific discovery. So that's something that I, I didn't know before, be, uh, before watching this video, reading the book actually. So the, the electromagnetic spectrum has all these wavelengths on it. Uh, and light, visible light, is one trillionth of a trillionth of what makes up the electromagnetic spectrum. Yet, thank goodness, we have an atmosphere that won't block out that visible light. For instance, if you go onto Venus, onto Venus you're not going to see anything because it's so dark. Uh, or Jupiter or all the other gas giants that also have atmospheres. So our atmosphere is clear and it blocks out the bad rays and allows in the good rays, the rays that are helpful. Isn't that a fantastic coincidence that we happen to, that organic life happens to exist underneath an, uh, an umbrella atmosphere that, that exists in, in, in such a way? I gotta make sure I don't wanna go over time. Let's see what time is it? Okay, now oh, perfect. All right, one more. The galaxy itself. I'll turn it on. Okay, and there we are in the galaxy. So we're kind of snugged in the middle of the galaxy. But notice, and this is what they're going to talk about a lot, we're not snugged inside one of the spiral arms. We're in between, okay? In 1997, Guillermo Gonzalez began a study of the Earth's specific location within the Milky Way galaxy. It would eventually lead him to more evidence of a correlation between life and discovery. Just as our location in the solar system is optimized for habitability, so is our location in the galaxy. We inhabit a spiral galaxy, which means it's highly flattened, it has a spherical bulge in the center and it has spiral arms. And we live about halfway between the center of the galaxy and the edge. Working closely with astrobiologist Peter Ward and Donald Brownlee, Gonzalez compared our position in the Milky Way to other regions within an often hostile galaxy. The galaxy has a lot of dangers and perhaps the most dangerous place in the galaxy is the galactic center. Well, in the center of the galaxy, this density of stars is, is very high, and there are more supernovas and stuff. And there are things that could harass life right in the dead center regions of our galaxy. You also have the giant black hole at the very center of the galaxy. And if it were to have a close encounter with a star passing near it, it would rip it to shreds and form an accretion disk around it and emit lots of radiation, particle radiation and electromagnetic radiation, gamma rays, x-rays. While a black hole, exploding stars, and deadly radiation would make complex life virtually impossible near the galactic core, the outer edge of the Milky Way poses other challenges to habitability. In the outer regions, uh, the situation is much more subtle. We live on a planet made out of iron, magnesium, and silicon, and oxygen. If we went in the more distant regions of our galaxy, out towards the outer, outer edge, the abundances of these elements are lower. There probably aren't enough heavy elements to build Earth-sized planets that can support life. So there's a happy median between the dangerous galactic center and the outer edge of the galaxy. Gonzalez, Brownlee, and Ward labeled this region where complex life is possible within the Milky Way the galactic habitable zone. Their theory was first published in 2001 and has since received growing acceptance among astrobiologists. There's a lot more research that needs to be done to determine just how wide the habitable zone is, but I think there's general agreement that yes, there are definitely places in the galaxy that you cannot have civilizations because they're very dangerous. And there are places where you just have a very low abundance of heavy elements. While these obstacles to habitability are minimized far from the core and edge of the Milky Way, Gonzalez has also identified large areas within the galactic habitable zone itself, which are less hospitable to complex life. Even within the habitable zone in the galaxy, it's broken by the spiral arms, which are dangerous places. That's where most of the supernovae go off in the galaxy. That's where uh, the star formation is taking place. We don't want to be too close to a spiral arm. We, we want to be outside the spiral arm, 
at about the right region of the galaxy. It appears this is precisely where the Earth is located, in the relatively safe and uncrowded region between the Sagittarius and Perseus arms of the Milky Way. Location is everything, and so we occupy that special place in the galaxy where habitability is optimized, threats are minimized, and we have enough building blocks to build an Earth. Guillermo Gonzalez and Jay Richards have conducted research on another facet of the galactic habitable zone. They now argue that the Earth is also located in the best setting within our galaxy for astronomical research. As it turns out, our position in the universe is not only critical for life, but it's also surprisingly important for making scientific discoveries. We're located near the midplane of the galaxy, a very highly flattened galaxy, between spiral arms in a region with very low dust extinction. While we are in the plane of the galaxy, that does not obscure a large part of the sky, so we can have very clear views. For more than a century, this nearly ideal platform of observation has enabled astronomers to study the structure of the Milky Way. Looking toward the constellation Sagittarius on a clear night, for example, we see that the stars in our galaxy are not uniformly distributed across the sky. Instead, they appear as part of a concentrated band, a flattened disk of stars, dust and gas, 100,000 light years in diameter. The Milky Way band in the night sky is us looking edge on into the plane of the galaxy. If we were living in the center of the galaxy, things would look much more spherically distributed. And so it will be very hard to distinguish things that are inside the galaxy from things that are outside. And it's also very dusty, much dustier towards the galactic center than it is in our region. And so the views of the distant universe will be much more difficult to obtain, will be much more compromised. Similar problems would exist for astronomers working on a planet located within any of the galaxy's spiral arms. Here, denser concentrations of dust clouds and gas illuminated by stars would make it difficult to determine the shape of the Milky Way or to distinguish the stars in our galaxy from the rest of the universe. On the surface of the Earth, we're really in the optimum position for seeing both the nearby structure of the Milky Way galaxy as well as seeing the distant cosmos as a whole. So once again, we see that the best location for habitability and for producing a habitable planet is also the best overall position for scientific discovery, in this case, at the galactic scale. Okay, that's all I'm gonna show you. Now, just keep, keep in mind what we just saw was three examples of how it, it looks suspicious, suspicious that um, the Earth, the solar system is located in a, in a clear spark part of the Milky Way galaxy, and the Milky Way galaxy happens to be kind of flat. So we can't really look through the galaxy for knowledge about the universe, but we can look up and look down, you know, and we get clear views. And it, isn't that wonderful that we can do that? And also that we have an atmosphere that's also clear, that uh, allows through visible light not only sustain, sustain all living things, but also allows light to go in, uh, from the stars and from other celestial objects to also come through so we can study. Um, we can study the universe and the solar system and so on. Uh, and then we also happen to have a moon that also keeps life sustained through tidal uh, friction and through uh, uh, keeping the, the angle at 23 degrees so that we have seasons, we can grow crops. Uh, but also, it's the kind of moon that allows us to study the universe too because of just how big it is. So, not only do uh, we have to have 147 boxes filled, those are just three, we have to have 147 of them filled in order to su sustain complex life, but also the complex life such as you and me with a yearning to learn about the place that we live called the universe, okay? Pretty interesting stuff. And just one final thing. So God took six days to create the universe, right? Um, and it says in numerous places in scripture that there's gonna be a new heavens and a new earth. And you know, God took six days to think out, think out this universe. How many thousands, this is an old Keith Green song. I don't know if you guys remember Keith Green. There's an old Keith Green song that says, uh, 
just, he's been thinking about the new heavens and the new universe, or the new earth, for thousands of years. <laughs> what is that going to be like? So that's going to be an amazing thing. That's going to be an amazing thing. Our universe already is amazing, and it's cursed. You can imagine the next universe that we will experience after all this time. It's going to be incredible. It's going to be an incredible thing. Okay, and we're being resurrected. We'll also be able to appreciate it in a far different level than we're able to appreciate it uh, now. And we, we are certainly able to appreciate it. It's a, we live in a wonderful place. Um, so, there you go. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. Um, and thanks for coming. <laughs>